So fundraising is hard. I learned it on the job. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I fully learned it. It's different at different stages. Um, and the hard part is it's not a science, it's an art. There's no answer, necessarily. Um, I think uh, I think an interesting point to start with before I talk about tactically what I've learned about fundraising is that um, you, if you're the CEO, if you're responsible for fundraising, you are the company's biggest scaling problem. Right? Startups have a number of scaling problems. Like, um, but like the founding team as a whole, um, but particularly like you, um, the question is, even before you've launched, the startup is either growing or dying, right? And if you're not growing, you're dying. And, and it is accelerating and it's maturing. And you, it is encountering problems at an increasing rate by definition, as it, as it scales. Even before it launches, it's scaling in a way. And if you can't solve problems faster than it encounters them, you are the, the limiting factor. You are the, um, the choke point. Um, so, the, if you don't already, if you haven't already learned these skills, your ability to learn quickly, rapidly, about how to solve whatever problems you have um, is like the number one asset of the business and like number one thing that you should be focused on. Um, so one of the things I, I love about the, the, the job is that it's so challenging because whatever, like the problems are different at every stage and like I'm constantly dealing with a new type of problem that I haven't solved before. And if I've solved it before, then it's easier. Um, it's like, ah, I remember you. Uh, like, you know, here are the three ways I can go about this. Um, uh, so, um, you know, in the very beginning, in the very, very beginning, you are some random person in the universe with an idea, right? Um, and, the question is, what's the next step? Um, and the next step could be either trying to raise money right away, just with you and an idea, or trying to find co-founders. Um, and uh, and then, if you let's just say you find co-founders and then you raise money, um, and then you get to what milestone? And then you raise more money, and then you get to what milestone? And then you raise more. Like, there's some process there, and there's a lot of variables. Um, and it depends on the startup, like what makes the most sense. Um, I think that um, the there's so many ways I can go in, in right now in this conversation. I think um, there's no way I can possibly give a like comprehensive um, download of everything I've learned about fundraising in in, in an interview just in one set in one go. Um, so that's actually why it's really important for you to have advisors. Um, people who've done this before. There are a lot of startup founders like in Silicon Valley that you can connect with. And even in, you know, in any other major technology city like New York, LA. Um, and get their time. Um, they will be empathetic. Um, I find it so hard, so hard to turn down um, an email from uh, a young founder who needs advice and ask, knows how to ask for it the right way. Um, even if I don't have time, even if I'm fighting for my survival, like I still make the time because it just, I, 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 I get it. I, I feel for them. Um, so, um, uh, the, the process for us went like this. Um, I, I graduated from college. I was staying, at, you know, in this place in Palo Alto. I was living off of my own, like, what, you know, some some money that I'd saved up, and uh, and whatever I could borrow from my parents, <laughs> and uh, and I was like, I, you know, I had this vision, I had this idea, um, and I needed, I knew I needed money and a team and advisors in whatever order I could get them, <laughs> um, and most important thing was forward motion. 
And, um, and so I had like, you know, my typical day was like two, two coffees before breakfast, two breakfast, two more coffees, like two lunches, like three afternoon meetings, like, uh, you know, two dinners, two drinks, like tried to just pack it all in and build a network. And I think the art of building, a, like building a network is really important. Um, I have a whole elaborate process for, for doing it. Um, and the wonderful thing about, I think, the San Francisco Bay Area as opposed to New York or Los Angeles is that the culture here is that for, you know, nobody's gatekeeper. So if you can, if you find someone who becomes passionate about your idea and likes you and like, I remember like so many people who are like just whipped open their laptop and like while I was sitting next to them, jaw dropped, they'd be like, let me make some intros for you. Boom, 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 boom. And like the 10 intros later, be like, have a nice day. All right, see ya. And you know, these people are not slouches. They're introducing you to like legit people. Um, so um, let's think about some basic uh, math. Um, you know, if five, if you, if you meet only five new people a week, new high quality people a week, um, over a year, that's um, 250 people. Um, over uh, a decade, that's 2,500 people. Over a 40 year career, that's 10,000 people. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, and most people just don't have, they aren't organized enough to, to um, stay in touch with those people and cultivate them to the like level which it's possible. Um, and I think, you know, Keith Ferrazzi um, uh, was recently introduced to me and I've been reading his book, um, Never Read Alone. And one of the things he's very wise about is generosity. Like you should try to like create as much value for these people as possible um, before like asking, if you can. Um, uh, you don't wanna be a taker and you don't need to have any wealth um, to like, be generous. Um, I remember like my first three months in Silicon Valley, I tried to like make as many intros as I received, which was so weird and bizarre, but it actually ended up, you know, people really appreciate it. Um, and there are other ways you can, you can, you can show um, generosity by helping people, what have you. Um, and, um, and also just having the integrity to know that even if you can't help somebody back now for something that they've received, it doesn't need to be quid pro quo. Like people, every time they help you, don't necessarily want to be immediately helped in return because then they feel like, you know, it was a transaction. Um, but knowing that you in the long run will, will make sure that you like pay them back um, uh, or like should express your gratitude is important. Um, so your network should expand non-linearly. Like you shouldn't be meeting five new people a week. You should be meeting five new people a day. And like at that rate, you know, uh, what's the math? Uh, you know, do the math. Um, and you should be working like six days a week. So like five times six times, you know, um, four times 12 uh, ends up being a lot of people. Um, and each of those people, so here's an interesting story. Um, I had an intern, John, who was amazing. Um, he was sort of landed at our doorstep basically. He had, a, his university was paying for him to like do an internship in Silicon Valley. And he was as green as can get, but he was humble and motivated. And so uh, this is sort of like one of his first major work experiences. So I said, look, here's your job. Figure out all the people I know who know people I wanna know. And as a result of that, we ended up getting like some three ridiculous investors on board. Um, and like, I wish I could say who they are. Um, because they're, you know, that would like make the story that much cooler. Um, and, uh, and so, so there's that. Um, Sales, which is what fundraising is, um, is more about process than it is about persuasion. So a good formula in your mind is sales equals process plus persuasion. The persuasion side of it, like there's a lot of tactics like, you know, you can learn about how to be more persuasive. Um, I think the one lesson that is worth more than all of them combined is if you can truly believe that given everything you know about the other person, if you were the other person, you would do this thing that you're asking them to do, then you can have, it's, it's called Integrity Selling. There's a book by Ron Willingham by that title. Do that. Like sell with integrity because I know if I were you, I'd do this. It's in your interest. 
that works because people are so good at picking up if you don't if you're act if you're just in your mind about what you want um, and if you're like scamming them or you don't truly believe it, it makes sense for them. Um, so that's on the persuasion side. Most people try to improve, like they try to look for all the gains on the persuasion side and that's a massive mistake because there's just probably not that much room for you to improve. Let's just say that you can be twice as persuasive, right? I think it is harder to be twice as persuasive as it is to be 10 times more organized and 10 times more process driven, right? So like, you know, you're trying to exact these little gains here and you just get huge gains on the other side. Um, and um, so what I mean by that is, let's just say, um, you know, you were twice as persuasive as you are now and you're trying to ask me for money. Um, like, you know, you could still fail and get nothing, right? But if you talk to 10 people, maybe you get one. And if you talk to 100, maybe you get 10. And um, most people just don't do enough prospecting. Um, there's so many stories that I've heard about people seeking venture capital um, where they've been to like, you know, 40 firms and the 43rd gives them the check. Seriously, it's a, a hotmail is a great example of that. Um, you know, my friend's company, I can't disclose, but it just did it. Uh, it was like, they were shocked. It's like this, you know, just, and it happened. Um, and I think realizing that there's, um, you know, startups have this like, I, I call it the Van Gogh problem. Van Gogh created art. At the time, nobody thought it was art. They thought it was just like paint on canvas. Nobody appreciated it, literally. Like, just some random dude just creating this stuff and it's not valuable. This is shit, right? Um, and then he died and then at some point, everyone realized this is great work. And that is the problem a lot of startups deal with. Like, you know, the question of like, what valuation should you get, um, you know, is, it totally depends on whether the world understands that what you're building is art yet or not, and whether you can convince them that it is art. Um, value is subjective. So, um, so there may be, the, the nice thing about fundraising is that success is inherently always around the corner. There's always one person who could give you $10 million, right? And there's, there's plenty of liquidity in the world. There's plenty of, there's plenty of capital in the world. It's just like, you know, can you find that person? And, and realizing that progress is so nonlinear. You know, for every meeting, you don't get X dollars. It's just like, you don't get X dollars, you get zero dollars for like 100 meetings and then you get all the dollars in one meeting. It's, uh, it's somewhat maddening actually. Um, so, oh my God, I mean, I could just keep going uh, about fundraising. Um, I, I think I should, before shutting up, um, like walk through a basic, basic process. The seed fundraising landscape is so effed up and nobody's talking about it, I think. Uh, I just wrote a blog post on, I, I stayed up, <laughs> I had a busy, busy day, crazy week, and I was like, it was like midnight on Wednesday and uh, inspiration struck me and I just, I, I didn't sleep and at 8 a.m. I published this post. Um, it's like 30 minute long read, so it's long. And um, you can find it on medium.com um, and just type my name. Um, and it got, 25,000 views in like the first 32 hours. <laughs> no promotion, no, it's just like on a blog. And because I said stuff that like people have been afraid to say. Um, and basically, you know, there's some history. I, I think that basically over the last, I'm using the word basically a lot. That's basically messed up. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, since I came to Silicon Valley till today, has been like a giant education in the capital markets, uh, in the risk capital markets, markets the venture capital markets. Um, and, um, and the capital markets, like markets are not efficient, right? Like efficient market theory is a good way of understanding basic economics, but like the actual, when you're in them, they're not efficient. Um, there are startups that are uh, getting irrationally high valuations and getting funding that like I think shouldn't. Um, and again, that's my opinion. And then there are startups that should be getting tons of funding um, or should be getting reasonable amounts of funding. Uh, and then there aren't. Um, and I think that's because um, there are very few like investors, like most people, um, most 
investors like operate on flocking behavior. They like um, there's like there's a round coming together, and so and so and so and so and so and so is in it, and there's a little bit. You know, do you want in? Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, there's an opportunity that is disappearing on Friday, and this could be the next Twitter. And like, you know, it's fine if you pass in the deal, but like, you know, um, but if you do and it is, then you know, your firm is is gonna hate you and you're gonna get fired, right? And then fear, boom, they they come in. Um, so. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of psychology in, in, in fundraising, and the the capital markets problem the, the capital markets have structure and need to be understood. So, um, in the past, venture capital firms used to fund startups right at the beginning, or almost right at the beginning. There'd be a small friends and family round of like a hundred or three hundred thousand, and then like you know you could get a, a Kleiner Perkins to like give you like a million bucks or three million bucks or whatever. Um, and they would take a board seat, and there'd be an equity round, and you would uh, you perform, and then you know you'd probably make it to the next level. Um, that's not happening. It hasn't been happening for uh, you know seven or so years at least, um, because uh, costs went down to start businesses, um, and it all of a sudden you know cost only five hundred thousand dollars to like get a product to market, and about a million dollars to. Um, build a business model around the product, and return. There's a lot of wins. So like angel investors came in and started like making lots of bets, and so there's this huge market of like angels, all the seed capital flooding in, and VCs were fine with that because they could raise bigger funds and take later stage bets. So they like VCs went out of the seed game and went into the A round game, and um, and uh, and then mobile came along and. Also, quality in general, like, just has to go up because consumers, like, there's just, you know, you have to build such a better product today than you had to build seven years ago to, like, be good enough. Um, and so, I think it costs, like, a million dollars to launch something interesting and uh, probably another, you know, one to two million dollars to, like, build a business model around it, build a business. Um, and, and the... Uh, and so angels have sort of like, and there haven't been, because a lot of this stuff is happening on mobile, there haven't been a lot of wins on mobile. So angels are starting to get burnt out. And like there's, so what happens is that angels are funding like up to a million dollars and then it's like really hard to get angel funding beyond that. But that's still too early to raise the A round. So you hear about the Series A crunch? Like that is the Series A crunch. Like it's just, you, you haven't built a business yet, you've launched an interesting product, angels funded you, now you're screwed. Um, <laughs> And um, and uh, and like angel appetite and thing in general is like uh, low right now. And, and uh, you know markets when I say they're irrational, like right now they're only investing in or there's a lot of investing in like enterprise software as a service businesses and um, like business not con non consumer businesses, right? Um, Everyone's leaving one space and going into another because that space is perceived as safer. And you know, markets go through these cycles, um, and eventually, you know, then eventually, like, enterprise won't be hot, and the consumer will be hot. Um, but if you're an entrepreneur and you're entering into this chaos, right, and you don't understand it, you're gonna make mistakes, and that's okay. <laughs> but like, do your best to like bring people around you to help you navigate this chaos. So. If you're Mark Zuckerberg, find Sean Parker, find Matt Kohler, you know, find these people who can help you navigate it, put you on a trajectory, groom you, and you know, think about company development or company building as distinct from product development or product building or business development or business building. There's an art to like grooming a company for success and navigating all of this and like getting through it. Because in my experience, most from my observations of my own network over the last two years and what has worked and what's not, um, companies don't fail because they build a bad product that nobody wants. Companies don't fail because they don't have an amazing idea and companies don't fail because they don't have really competent founders who are capable of getting, executing and getting the business to the next milestone. They fail because they can't navigate all this craziness and like this craziness is really complicated and most people just they, they they don't realize that they're playing in this game. They don't even realize the game that they're playing in. And um, 
and uh, they um, and they think that VCs they're not getting adequate feedback. 